great. Welcome everybody to uh, week eight. Uh, congratulations. You officially passed the meter mark. Uh, today, a slightly different lecture, no whiteboard, but a lot of slides, a lot of information. But before we dig into uh, this week's topic, I just want to acknowledge um, the fact that I received a lot of messages from you via email and other comments, um, and I have reposted a link to the guidelines to both the midterm uh, paper draft as well as the final paper. I hope you found those guidelines useful. I also want to remind you that you can definitely use all the resources, including the library resources, uh, in order to be better prepared for the draft. Now, um, at risk of sounding repetitive, please keep in mind that the draft is exactly what it sounds like. I'm not expecting anybody to write a scientific paper, but at this stage, simply to express what direction you would like to embark on, to take, in order to prepare for the final uh, project. The final project, yet again, is the final paper. Now, given the complexity of the topic that we cover this semester, as I mentioned multiple times now, uh, please uh, do not hesitate in reaching out to me to see if the topic applies to the course or not. But as long as there is some level of connection uh, with psychology and with consciousness, you can safely assume that you will not be off topic in preparing for the final, okay? So the draft is just a general direction, a few paragraphs, a page long uh, to describe uh, what the interest you have at this point is and how you're going to connect that to the final paper. That's really all I'm asking you. Um, in terms of how to uh, present it, uh, the best way is to access the um, clickable link in the module itself, because that will give me the chance to reply to you directly, give you a direct feedback. But if you still experiencing uh, some technical glitches, in the worst case scenario, you can just send to me this uh, draft via email. It might take me a little longer because I have a lot of students to reply to those emails. So I would prefer if you could do that via uh, the link posted in the module, but if you can't, uh, please do not hesitate to uh, choose the second option. All right, so this week uh, we will cover what I usually like to refer to as medicine on, off, and off with 2F, the brain, which is the practical application of what we discussed so far. Now, what do you mean by practical application? I mean the application of everything we discussed so far about consciousness, both in terms of the current research studies, as well as the theoretical approaches to consciousness in a clinical setting. This means that um, you could also view this uh, week's lecture as a way to better prepare for a possible uh, career path in therapy, counseling, coaching, psychology, psychotherapy, psychiatry, as well as in any other branch of healthcare. Keep in mind that uh, we are talking about the mind-body connection. So really anything has to do with the healing part of human interaction will be at the center of today's lecture. Now, a lot of slides. And at this point, um, I hope you uh, were able to relate to my style of uh, asking you questions via quizzes and discussions. But I also added a few more descriptors to possibly be uh, more precise in navigating all the philosophical concepts. Which brings me to another consideration. I really enjoyed reading your discussion posts uh, this past week because uh, I do realize how uh, committed you are to studying these topics. And it's really, uh, it's really well, beneficial to me as, as your instructor, but also makes me feel good about the way you are expressing uh, curiosity, an open-minded approach, uh, to knowledge, as well as inclusion and tolerance and overall love. So this last word, love, um, as much as I would say it's uh, very much abused uh, in a pop psychology um, state of affair on social media, for instance, it's nevertheless one of the most important thing that we should keep in mind in talking about consciousness. And this is also very useful because when I talk about medicine, in of and off the brain, the assumption is that there is a type of healing process that occurs in the brain, and of course, in an extended brain in the body with physiological processes, okay? but also 
a type of medicine that's of the brain that belongs to the brain as the brain being the primary master computer organ for everything else that occurs in the body, but also of we too have the brain as a way to discuss something that it's not matter based. Now, uh, this applies to the discussion we had, especially this past week, which was a discussion that definitely focused on transcendental aspect, on philosophy, on spirituality. And this is because one of the requirements, uh, one of the institution, college, university requirements for a, a course in the psychology of consciousness is the ability to connect the dots. Now, as I mentioned this multiple times, this is not a course that attempts to uh, push any specific narrative per se, in terms of how we should interpret those studies that we discussed so far. But it would be very disingenuous for me to tell you that there is no agenda whatsoever in any university course. What do I mean by that? Well, the term agenda, as the name implies, has to do with the activating properties of what I'm saying. So, of course, I really hope that you will bring home some of the things we studied. And there is a selective process in the way I presented those studies to you. Now, I hope that you will develop a independent, somewhat skeptical mindset on your own to view these studies to make sure that you are reading between the lines and you understand how the studies are constructed. But a very nurturing aspect of everything we discussed so far is that every study from a meta-analysis perspective leads to the exact same considerations, some of which can be viewed as, yes, mind and bodies are connected. Yes, consciousness is more than just matter. And yes, if we want to approach science from a more inclusive, as in holistic perspective, then we should take into account the research studies conducted in the lab, as well as thousands and thousands of years of human history, especially in those areas that connect the mind, the body, and the spirit. So without further ado, let's begin today's discussion. Uh, three words, to treat, to heal, to cure. Now, I would like to start with the first one, to treat, and this is one of those terms that are very broad in the... Um, the, the way it describes our clinical intervention and also represents uh, a connection between mind and body because you can say that a person might be uh, more or less apt to treat mental health disorders, medical disorders, to treat temporary conditions, to treat chronic problems, to treat localized, specialized problems, as opposed to to treat the person as a whole. And as you would imagine, in the latter case, treating the person as a whole, this would be the realm of those integrative, complementary, and alternative uh, medical parameters that, of course, should have the patients at the center of therapy. And this is a whole other um, discussion, a fascinating topic that, uh, if you'd like to find more about, I, I will um, recommend you take a look at uh, other videos uh, that I have posted in that specific area of, um, of, of teaching. And there are uh, courses dedicated to, to that topic specifically. I will, I will add the link below. But in general, the idea is this. You are more likely to be able to help a person if you understand the parameters according to which the healing process occurs. And so from the perspective of treating the person, you will help the body foster its own uh, healing process, its internal healing process. We mentioned some of that in the context of those uh, neurotransmitters, uh, chemicals, hormones um, that are at the center of um, pain, pain receptors. If you think about um, what we said about uh, dopamine, what we said about the gate uh, control theory uh, of pain, uh, what we said about uh, encephaline, what we said about beta endorphins in the context of physical exercise, for instance, uh, and this, this general idea of endorphic inner uh, proper way the body understands uh, how to heal itself by virtue of creating this cascade of neurochemical processes that support that uh, pathway. So again, what do we mean by medicine on, off and off the brain? Well, in the first case, uh, medicine on the brain, well, this simply uh, identifies the clinical um, 
uh, argumentations, processes, and discussion on the way medicine acts on brain structure in order to foster um, the healing uh, perspective and to foster um, pro prognostic um, discussion in this area. So a, a medicine that is applied on the brain, that's the first clinical element. Uh, medicine of the brain, that type of medicine that again has to do with those very ingredients that are um, pretty much the, the neural correlates of, uh, of body function. Uh, so the, the main area of this of the discussion will be pathophysiology, for instance, and in, in a broader sense, um, uh, neuropsychoimmunology, to give an example, medicine of the brain. The third one is the most philosophical of them all, medicine of the brain, as in separate from the brain, not because the brain is discarded, disregarded as important, but because it is a type of medicine that goes beyond brain function, and dare to say beyond body function. And this is represented by the discussion of mind-body connection, so as in focusing on that part of that uh, interaction between dualism and monism where mind controls the body. And so medicine of the brain is a type of medicine that fosters inner guidance, I dare to say, that definitely has a uh, psychological and transcendental component to it what we do in order to properly, positively stimulate the body. So just to give you a few examples, medicine of the brain, you can think of integrative traditional approaches such as mindfulness, meditations, uh, body scan, uh, guided imagery, uh, prayer, um, um, exercise, uh, specific neural breathing techniques and so on and so forth. So me medicine that is definitely uh, working on the body structure because we are not separate from our bodies regardless if you're taking into account an embodied cognition perspective or, or your purely uh, mechanistic materialist perspective but a type of medicine that it is mainly focused on the healing path so let's go back to this treat heal cure uh, component the healing process in itself has to do with making the body whole again making our sense of self whole again this integration and continuation of self. Uh, think about the work by uh, Mario Bunge in, in, the, in this uh, regard, uh, or all the work by, by, by uh, positive and humanistic psychology for that matter. So uh, the healing process as the connection between to heal, the healing element, health, as well as wealth, holy, whole, wholeness, all these etymologically related terms that have to do with this idea of reintegrating mind and body okay for now we just assume this you know duality okay we, we are not taking into account the third element the spiritual element the transcendental element so this integration between what we perceive with our senses with our body what our body has to say about the way we feel sick the way uh, the disorder uh, um, develops and, and makes sense in terms of pain perception and on the other one the way we feel on a more uh, emotional cognitive level in order to say ethereal or, or transcendental level so this is the healing part the curing part of course the, the term itself could be pushed in a um, iatric perspective think about iatri as a term um, in, 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 the, in the medical sense of this etymology think about psychiatry for instance as opposed to psychology whether the, the, the psychiatric component has to do with the treatment with the cure and uh, psychology has to do with the study, with the science of the psyche. So uh, one element is connected to that part, and the other element is predicated upon the fact that there is an assumption of fixing the problem. Now, I don't want to be uh, unnecessarily polished in this sense. Uh, I do understand that claiming to cure someone is uh, scientifically not that precise of a term because, again, we can only support the body in its work, so you're not fixing the problem, you're, you're stimulating uh, the natural process that already occurred in the body. But for the sake of argumentation here, uh, to cure simply means to create a condition according to which the body will eventually find the best possible integrated, reintegrated self in a homeostatic sense where an uh, infection will no longer be present, to give you an example. But there's an intrinsic difference between treating, healing, and curing because the idea is this. If you treat, there is a connection between the provider and the patient. 
if you're healing the connection goes beyond that and focuses on the integration of something that's been separated disintegrated dissociated and in the third case you we want to work on on the fixing last part of the process which is very often unfortunately what what medicine especially in the western biomedical model has been um, uh, understood to be you're not preventive you're not uh, fostering appropriate health you're just simply trying to avoid mitigate or control the possible worst outcome in this sense now of course what is uh, kind of interesting is that uh, in regarding to the term to heal we could spend multiple semesters discussing the connection between wholeness and holistic holism um, um, healing etc etc and, and also spend some time distinguishing some how can I say it, uh, folk etymology so that there, there is a distinction between holism from hollows the, the continuation and, and, and the integration and um, uh, and healing in terms of what you're actually doing what the body is doing uh, but let's leave from, from uh, that from aside Let, let's leave that aside from a second um, in terms of treating and curing etymologically speaking uh, the assumption that curing it's fixing the problem and treating is actually providing support it's it's, it's not really correct because really uh, in terms of treating uh, treatment um, treating and therapy are connected in, in a historical and pragmatic sense uh, a therapeutic intervention is there to to treat to support the patient but it's not that the care is separate from cure in fact the cure is care okay etymologically speaking uh, they both come from the latin uh, cura and the interesting thing is that curing someone despite the fact that it might sound very judgmental can be um, applicable not just in the perception of uh, body control also curing a physical disease but also curing a mental problem curing even a spiritual problem to give an example one of the uh, the uh, old terms for a priest uh, or a pastor even was the curato d'anime so the person who takes care of the person's souls not the person who cures the person's soul necessarily in a judgmental way the person that is there to uh, to blame the person but it's a person who provides support in order to remove all those obstacles to the person's soul uh, in order to achieve uh, this 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 uh, uh, theosis we would say in in, uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy this this, this uh, connection to the uh, enlightenment from the, the the realization of one's own uh, divine origin so to speak so uh, um, to cure it's not necessarily a, a judgmental word per se despite the fact that it's less and less used uh, in a medical uh, context Now, this is, of course, connected to what we said last week, uh, or rather in the last two weeks, con uh, in connection to the sensus divinitatis, this sense of the divine, uh, according to Alvin Plantinga, uh, to give you an example, just one, one name, and that is predicated upon the assumption that in order for us to feel better, feeling better on a psychological level and also on a physical level, we get to get our sense of the divine straighten out so to speak now i do understand that this by definition is very judgmental it may even uh, be um, perceived as dogmatic as in either you follow those rules otherwise you'll never get better and yet i wouldn't consider that necessarily as a an inner fallacy for this type of argument to give an example let's think about the connection between uh, neuroscience and medicine now there are things that are easily uh, observed in the context of for instance brain imaging and the only issue there is to verify whether what we observe is the ultimate truth we talked about that when we mentioned the word by uh, Bloom for instance and the fact that um, observation it's not full understanding it's just description of what you observe but nevertheless it's hard to argue against solid science if all your biological neurological and uh, brain imaging um, apparatus claims to have found a you cannot say that you can see b in that context so science is pretty straightforward in that sense um, and so you would say that 
according to this biomedical model, it is not or it should not be perceived as um, unnecessarily um, judgmental uh, to claim that I, as a doctor, for instance, am an expert in what I observe in your uh, brain scan, to give an example. You might disagree with me in terms of what that means personally for my own healing process, but it would be really hard to argue against solid science. And that is why there are elements of this uh, um, assumption that are predicated uh, on authority alone. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, authority alone, it's generally speaking, not a sound argument in a uh, logical, uh, um, philosophical sense. So you cannot just say that someone is a good scientist because he is a good scientist or she is a good scientist. You, you would say simply that this person's uh, scientific study is more or less uh, um, indicative of taxonomical errors, for instance, or statistical errors, etc., etc. So, in other words, you would not judge um, a study simply based on the authority of the physician that uh, produced the study, whether she is a good physician or not. Um, however, in the context of medicine, you can also rely on the fact that none of us is an expert in every field. We mentioned this multiple times, and so some level of authority is warranted. You would assume that the person went to medical school or graduate school for neuroscience and because you, you don't have the depth of knowledge, you rely on the academic authority of the person to understand that that is probably the best recommendation at that point. So this is one element that is definitely true for, um, for the biomedical model. Uh, again, hard sciences are harder to argue against. We talk about that in the... Uh, um, in, in chapter two. Um, now, what about the psychological process? What about the intersection between mind and body? Well, what Alvin Plantinga and others uh, have claimed is that this sensus divinitatis, this, this awareness, this, this, I don't want to use the term paranormal, uh, supernatural, or, uh, or um, how can I say this, or um, esoteric um, perception because uh, th those are poorly constructed terms that, that, are, that sound very imprecise to me at least. And, and, and then w w if, you, if you use the term uh, para, paranormal or, or supernatural, what, what do you exactly mean by that? Do you mean that if something is supernatural, it does not have any neural correlates, natural correlates, biogenetic correlates? Well, I have to fully disagree on that. We, we have a brain for a reason, a very important one. And what do you mean by paranormal? It goes beyond what the norm is? Well. We're talking about medicine. We always work on normal distribution in statistical analysis in epidemiological sense. And you, you, I would much rather uh, talk about outliers in this perception. When these outliers are justified uh, on the calculations that you, you constructed or not, this is something that has to do more with mathematics rather than philosophy or theology. So I, I'm not particularly fond of, of those terms. But in any case, if someone like Plantinga claims that healing can happen the closer you are to the development of the sense of the divine, the sense of divinitatis, this will also warrant some level of um, authority. For instance, um, you could rely on a wise um, advice in order to feel better about yourself, despite of the fact that this advice will really go against everything you believe about yourself. And this is really not a surprise. In, in, in psychology, this is an everyday circumstance, and in medicine, it's definitely the case. Um, uh, what might be good for you might not be perceived as such by you in this very moment. For instance, think about physical pain. If you are in excruciating pain, if you just had you know, a, a rotator cuff um, uh, surgery, for instance, the fact that I'm going to ask you, uh, as your surgeon, to do some exercises in order to ameliorate the function of your shoulder will really be something that you won't like. You won't like on a physical level, pretty straightforward, and you might not even like on an emotional level because pain has a way to cripple in all our senses. And yet, despite the fact that I don't feel good, I don't think it's good, I don't actually perceive that as good in my body, it is a good things to do because you as a surgeon have that knowledge to promote my um, restorative element. So the same thing for this sense of divinitatis. 
Now, of course, because we're talking about the divine sphere, it's something that is not empirically verifiable, or at least not in the same way as um, you know, an infection is, then the issue remains, okay, which one has the ultimate truth to, uh, to promote? And, and is there any way out of too much dogmatism, too much um, theological and judgmental self? Well, one of the ways to address this would be uh, either the, the very holistic, and yet to some extent, pop theological perspective that there are multiple ways to reach that sense of the uh, divine connection, um, or the other one that each road, each pathway to this extra sensory perception, again, I don't like the term too much, um, there, there are more uh, proper and less proper ways, but each way contains some level of truth, so to speak. And of course, depending what system of belief the person have, this person might make a judgment in the sense, well, for me, this is the primary way. Other ways are good as well, they might not be good for me. Now, of course, this adds another risk, and the risk of uh, missing judgment. Because, you know, in a statistical sense, you always want to make sure that you account for uh, false positives and false narratives. So, w w which area you would like to go to in order to prevent the biggest possible mistake? Would you venture on, on the risk of finding false positives, or would you venture uh, <clears throat> to find the risk on positive, uh, sorry, on, on, on false negatives? And this is something that we will uh, keep exploring. Uh, but yet again, the idea is this. If your self-perception on a body level, or an emotional level, cognitive, psychological, uh, uh, transcendental level is compromised, your very judgment will be compromised as a result of that. So you need to rely on another person. In other uh, lecture, I always mention this, if you are um, struggling with uh, a physical or mental disorder, it is always good to, uh, quote unquote, borrow someone else's brain or borrow someone else's um, heart. You find this in the lecture on depression that I linked uh, two weeks ago. And, and again, again, just to, to remember what I mean by that, you borrow someone else's brain in the sense that you borrow someone else's knowledge, scientific knowledge, to know what's good for you, despite the fact it might not feel good, uh, physically speaking to you. And you might borrow someone else's heart if you want to have this emotional support that you yourself cannot find within yourself uh, in the context of low self-esteem, for instance, or, or negative emotions, suicidality, and so on and so forth. So, all of this considered, we are talking about judgment, and one of the things that I would like to mention in this uh, lecture about medicine on, off, and off the brain is the attitude of neuroscience and psychiatry toward what it means to be healthy, okay? To what it means to be cured, quote unquote, or treated, or successful, uh, well-adjusted, another term that I find myself in, in, in disagreement with. Um, well, you also want to remove the, the, the sense of unnecessary criticism to begin with, because yet again, you don't know everything, I certainly don't, and uh, assuming that you know more than the person treating you, it's also a false assum assumption, the same way as the person treating you should try to know as much as they can about you in order to know, to avoid mistakes. Example here, um, psychiatry and mental health institutions, psychiatric um, unit. Now, uh, in the context of judgmental um, medical labeling, medical jargon, medical terminology based intervention, the name that I mentioned last week, uh, Franco Basaglia, it's still one of the most important names in the context of critical neuroscience. Well, how to uh, sum up his work? Well, he was a you know brain scientist by definition, a psychiatrist, a trained, um, licensed as a psychiatrist, um, and also a person who had a profound knowledge of philosophy. Uh, he also worked in an uh, area of um, very integrative transcultural um, components. Uh, he worked in uh, Gorizia, which is a, uh, in Italian, it's a city at the, 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 the border between um, Italy and back in the days uh, Yugoslavia, nowadays Slovenia. Gorizia is the Italian name of, of, the, of the town, of the, of the city. Goetz is the German equivalent, and Gorica is the Slavic 
Slovenia in this case, name for the city. And so again, you have this Middle European connection between the Slavic, the Germanic, and the Italic uh, counterpart, the Romance counterpart more specifically, that creates very interesting cultural milieu that provided support for uh, a, a much more profound and analytical conceptualization of mental health. So long story short, he was instrumental to uh, have the Legge Basaglia, the Basaglia law approved in 1978. And there was a groundbreaking law that um, ultimately determined the fact that uh, Italy to this day is, uh, to, to my knowledge, the only country in the world where there are no psychiatric institutions per se. Now, of course, there are psychiatric units. I had part of my training um, at the University of Verona in, in the, in the uh, psychiatry and clinical psychology department, uh, but we don't have locked units the same way as we have in the United States, for instance. And this is something that is connected to what we said last week about uh, the anti-psychiatry movement. Um, although Basalia uh, himself was never a member of this movement, and again, I am very critical of the movement uh, in its uh, more extreme um, representations in the last 10, 15 years, unfortunately. But the idea of a judgmental self where a person can actually pontificate on what is good for the person and if the person does not abide by those behavioral, emotional, social, cultural rules, then this person has to be locked in a psychiatric unit. This is something that Basali really, really strived to get rid of um, on, a, on a moral, on an ethical, uh, on a clinical, medical, and ultimately on a legislative sense. Another fascinating factor, and possibly one of the core components of this course that I really want to uh, get across is that when we talk about words, words have meanings, words have weights. And by that I mean a weight in a neurobiological sense. So let, let's try to better understand what we're talking about here. So fibromyalgia is, is a condition that, that really causes pain pretty much all over the body. It's, it's, it's often accompanied by, by fatigue and, and problems with, with, with mood, uh, with, with memory, um, altered sleep, uh, and, and you know, emotional distress, mental distress, um, and this increased sensitivity to pain. Um, that um, affects the entire self. And so it's a great uh, example uh, for the connection uh, between mind and body. A great uh, problem in this context is really uh, the clinical assessment of fibromyalgia, given that it uh, still remains a mystery to a very big extent to the scientific community. And overall, you know, it's very much recommended to, to have a comprehensive uh, clinical and diagnostic assessment, uh, including a complete blood test with complete blood count, uh, erythrocytes, sedimentation rate, and of course, a psychological assessment as well, because as we mentioned, it's not just about uh, pain as if that wasn't enough, but it's about a, a, a deeper understanding of the perception of pain. Uh, an example in this context uh, is a uh, is, um, uh, research by Müller, Schneider and Schatz, uh, research uh, according to which we can identify at least four typologies of fibromyalgia with, with related uh, best uh, clinical um, treatment strategies uh, and, 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 and strategies for management. Uh, the first one has to do with extreme sensitivity to pain, but without associated psychiatric conditions. Um, 5-HT3 receptor blockers. The second one, fibromyalgia and comorbid pain-related depression for which uh, antidepressants are recommended. The third, depression with concomitant fibromyalgia syndrome, also uh, treated uh, uh, with antidepressants. And of course, psychotherapy, this is always the primary go-to uh, clinical treatment. And finally, for fibromyalgia due to uh, somatization, which in itself is connected to uh, psychotherapy, I wouldn't say alone, but primarily in comparison to 0.2 and 0.3. Finally, we also need to discuss uh, the connection between um, words and theoretical frameworks and the way we interpret health, the healing process on a personal level, as well as an, uh, on, on a social level, on a um, social policy, policy making, uh, perspective. Now, this has to do with uh, safety, with privacy, 
with understanding, with note taking, and so everything that is connected to HIPAA rules and regulation, to the way EHR works, so electronic health records uh, work, on the way SOAP notes work, and SOAP notes are some of the most commonly utilized clinical notes where uh, the acronym indicates subjective, objective, assessment, and plan, so SOAP notes. Um, play a very important role in the way we uh, understand our patient. And again, keep in mind that understanding a patient simply means knowing what to do with the patient, okay? Uh, and by that I mean incorporation with the patient. Think of what we said, etymologically speaking, about the S-Y-N or C-U-M. Uh, so S-Y-N in Greek, S-C-U-M uh, in Latin. This togetherness. So we're not going to do something with the patient as in, I get I have to uh, I have to deal with the patient in a very judgmental and, and callous way, but I have to work with the patient because the patient provider relationship is essential for the amelioration of the physical and psychological presentation of this person. All of this is extremely important in this section of our course. I would say that epilepsy is probably one of the best examples. So what what is epilepsy? Why, why is it important to uh, discuss uh, in neuroscience, but even more so in the context of critical neuroscience? Um, and, and, and why is it relevant uh, because of its etiology, uh, related uh, diagnostic and prognostic features, uh, uh, its uh, representation in uh, a scientific field, as well as in a social, cultural, um, and I dare to say even media related field, you know, um, epilepsy has always been connected uh, in the context of uh, medical anthropology, for instance, to this, this sort of transcendental element. It was also uh, uh, nicknamed uh, sacred disease, to give an example. And there are plenty of accounts where, where uh, um, epilepsy is connected to what we would uh, otherwise label possibly in a very judgmental uh, and imprecise uh, sense as mystical experiences or mystical encounters. So how much truth is there? Can we say that um, epilepsy is the main cause for this transcendental, uh, out-of-body, uh, mystical, religious, spiritual experiences? Um, or can we say that we are possibly again tossing the baby with the bathwater? We just conflate these two elements into one as if epilepsy contains a causal factor um, as opposed to be a correlate or underpinning what, what's happening maybe in a non-bodily uh, um, situation. Those are all things that we will we'll discuss. And it's also important to understand that this is uh, yet um, a problem because the assumption is that you will find something in the body that will justify the presence and the process, so the way epilepsy starts and develops over time. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. I keep stressing the fact that working on evidence-based science is a good thing, is the primary way to approach this problem. Um, and so, to some extent, while I understand where this perspective comes from, I don't fully embrace it, the perspective according to which uh, neuroscience is becoming more and more neurologized, so to speak, uh, or even psychiatry is becoming too neurologized, becoming too neuroscience-based. And this is a perspective that we, we find in other, um, um, other uh, volumes, textbooks about critical neuroscience. I just think about uh, Chodorin Slavi, for instance, in the, you know, th those books that were, were published um, in the last 10 years or so. Again, critical neuroscience is a brand new field, and so there are uh, only a few um, solidly uh, based um, textbooks, and that will be one of such textbooks. So is it a bad thing that uh, psychiatry um, and neuroscience as a discourse are becoming more and more embedded from this perspective? So let, let's begin our conversation. So uh, last week we um, talked about clinical and medical neuroscience and if you remember we mentioned a few of the applications of these subfields um, considering the, the, the connection between uh, mind and body in, in, in the clinical setting. So um, working on uh, addiction and behavior um, as well as Alzheimer's disease, um, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders, uh, uh, mood and personality disorders autism, but also 
more medical, and by that I do not mean to say that what we said so far is less medical, but medical as separated from um, psychiatry specifically. So uh, dyslexia, cataplexy, uh, Down syndrome, epilepsy, uh, brain tumors, Huntington disease, um, neurological trauma, Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, uh, Tourette syndrome, stroke, and so on and so forth. And and we also mentioned that uh, the, the techniques that we previously mentioned, so EEG, MRT, MEG, TMS, and TSCS uh, are part of the standards in clinical and medical neuroscience. Now, of course, uh, in this context, something that I really want to um, encourage students to to research is the importance of, of neurogenesis uh, in this context. So uh, I will just pull up an, an image here. It's the same image that you have on page 104 um, in the textbook. Um, and this is uh, related to, again, the process of neurogenesis. And, and we mentioned uh, in the past how, how important that is um, to provide hope uh, to patients recovering from all the previously mentioned uh, mental and medical issues, uh, but also to uh, get a, a more um, scientifically accurate depiction of how our brain uh, works and repair itself. So um, in, in this specific picture, you can see an, an adaptation, a reinterpretation of the, of the neurogenetic model. And you can see that uh, in, in the bottom left ventricular zone, you can observe the neural uh, stem cells, neuroepithelial cell, and the neuron. The neuron is uh, rendered here in, uh, in silver, it's dark gray, uh, followed by the radial glial cells um, and, uh, and the neuron in blue and bright red, respectively, followed by type 3 cells in kind of a orangey, dark yellow, the ependymal cells in gray slash pink, uh, subventricular zone astrocyte, type 2 uh, cell in, in green, and oligodendrocyte precursor cell, the, this one is the, the other one, in bright orange, uh, bright orange yellow, um, all in the subventricular zone. Now, keep in mind that the, the SVZ or, or subventricular zone is one of these two regions where, where um, human neurogenesis um, exists, uh, um, both in the embryonic um, and in the uh, postnatal brain, the adult brain. Um, it, it's, it's a region uh, that is situated on the outside wall um, of each lateral ventricle of the vertebrate brain and, and contains multiple cell population, including um, neuroblasts and, and astrocyte-like cells. So... Um, Subventricular zone present both um, in prenatal and postnatal brain, uh, and in, in a neurogenic perspective, um, the, the the conceptualization of uh, what to do and what to expect in surgery and in the post-surgical period. This is important for uh, pretty much everything in uh, neurocritical care and neurointensive care, which is the next uh, part of uh, this chapter. Again, we mentioned critical in two, um, uh, in two main ways to interpret the terms, one critical from a philosophical perspective and the other one more in the context of the um, operating room. Uh, and this has to do with uh, multiple um, medical problems, some of which are more uh, neurogenetically based to some extent and to some other extent, they also can be uh, trauma-related and so uh, presenting a more uh, mental health-related issues. Issues. And I'm thinking about um, uh, strokes, uh, seizures, uh, um, intracranial edema or cephalitis, uh, meningitis, um, brain tumors, um, and um, immune system related problems uh, such as the Guillain Barr syndrome and possible medical complications uh, that can be uh, better uh, treated in this context uh, with multidisciplinary uh, treatment teams, including anesthesiology, neurology, uh, neurosurgery, where I mentioned the connection between these two terms, and emergency medicine. Now, in this regard, I also want to mention a very um, specific uh, medical issue, the one of epilepsy. And um, you are probably familiar with uh, some basic facts about epilepsy, the etiology of epilepsy. Um, it's still unknown, and, and, um, and, and very often this, uh, this problem had been uh, framed in the past as, as having some either mystical, in a positive sense, spiritual, or possible uh, demonic possession-like 
uh, presentation. So the, the very concept of a sacred disease uh, was connected to these uh, these medical problems. So what what, what is uh, epilepsy uh, specifically uh, in the context of of, of this uh, sacred disease um, interpretation? Temporal lobe epilepsy (TLE) it, it is a chronic disorder of the nervous system. Um, that has this uh, seizure, this, this unprovoked focal seizure uh, presentation that are, as the name implies, um, located in the temporal lobe of the brain. And those, those, uh, those seizures last about mm, one to, uh, to two minutes um, uh, on, on average. And, and, and that is why um, TLE uh, is one of the, the most common form of epilepsy with the focal um, seizures. And just as a general review keep in mind that there are uh, about 40 types uh, of epilepsy a little over 40 um, that are um, divided into two main groups focal seizure and generalized seizure in this context um, uh, TME focal seizures account uh, for roughly 60 percent of all uh, adult cases and TLE is the is the most common uh, form of them all now, in more modern time, this concept of a sacred uh, disease related to this um, medical um, issue, temporal lobe epilepsy, is the very, very uh, famous case of uh, Pius IX, the Catholic Pope, and the claim according to which um, a lot, if not most, of his uh, theology, especially late um, theological uh, pronouncement were connected to uh, again temporal lobe epilepsy that, uh, that you know he um, he uh, was suffering from. Now, of course, uh, as usual, uh, there are multiple interpretation and unfortunately misinterpretation of the role uh, and value, dare to say, of um, uh, TLE in, um, in 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 the Pope's um, um, pronunciation. And, and and of course that there, there there is no documented evidence that that, that Pius the Ninth had undertaken any uh, specific treatment for for this problem. Um, the, the, you know that there are apparently um, no medical records in, in this context. And by apparently, I don't mean to identify anything um, on the conspiracy theory perspective, but um, also due to sheer um, uh, scientific knowledge at the time. We're talking about uh, you know 1870. I think I believe. Um, 1871, 1872, roughly, and um, also the, the issue here is, is connected to the fact that, um, generally speaking, and there, there are some studies that indicate that as well, uh, the literature supporting the fact that everything uh, was caused by TLE tends to be uh, tends to have a negative view of um, Pius the Ninth in general, and uh, the opposite is true for positive views of uh, his theology and uh, less um, appreciation for the role that uh, temporal lobe epilepsy might have had um, in uh, in his work and his uh, thought process and and and, and by definition um, the spiritual connection with with these pronunciations. Now it is also important to uh, <coughs> to keep in mind that um, there are several of the do dogmatic aspects, the dogmas that that um, were part of uh, papal doctrine at that time were um, were already theoretically in place long before um, Pius the, the Ninth um, had the, the chance to really uh, talk and write about um, these theological aspects. So uh, we cannot really use epilepsy as a justification for that. Uh, what is true and what we know based on the on the, the, the literature and the current record is that he indeed had partial epilepsy, uh, which resulted from um, from an accident. That he he was um, victim of at a young age and, and, and a combination of anoxia and developmental an, an, anomalies that, that were evidenced by uh, hemiplegia and facial asymmetry uh, that you can you can notice in in, in the photographs uh, taken um, um, of uh, of the pope and of course we can say because of that, that epilepsy um, was indeed affecting um, a lot of, of the uh, psychological processes now what uh, it seems to be uh, a little non fully based on scientific evidence is that uh, the, the the doctrine itself uh, was indeed caused by um, by the um, epileptic seizure uh, in this in this context, and, and of course there is stigma about epilepsy that continues uh, to to this day. 
um, and uh, if there is a lesson to learn from uh, the view that um, um, epileptic seizures, especially in this context, uh, TLE has in society is um, our uh, increased awareness of the neurological foundation, the neural underpinnings on one side, the, the need for um, a more tolerant, inclusive, and, and empathetic uh, perception and support for uh, individuals suffering from it, and also the clear um, um, distinction between uh, experience, both personal experience as well as relational experience, societal experience on one side, and the um, etiological role of epilepsy so that we don't uh, confuse, confound those two things, we don't merge things together, claim that one is the causal factor of the other, despite the fact that um, we mentioned this multiple times, there are plenty of, of neurological um, evidence for at least the underpinning factor in this context. Now, I will include uh, here some of the articles that talked about the connection between the concept of a sacred disease on one side and the current scientific evidence uh, on temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, and also some work that are uh, some works that are parallel to neuroscience uh, that that sent from uh, biology, neurobiology, uh, um, and um, and theoretical um, uh, speculations on on these fields. I just think of of the work by by Robert Sapolsky in, in this context, and again the clear. Uh, identification with the fact that certain, uh, let's use the term, psychiatric presentation that might uh, be apparent um, in the context of an enhanced uh, sense of the religious, spiritual, mystical, transcendental, um, are connected to the interest itself. So being more interested in, in religious themes, not with direct perception of these uh, religious factors. And, and of course, but, but this I do not mean to say that this is not true in all cases of epilepsy, but we need to uh, distinguish, we need to separate the perception, the sensation, the phenomenon uh, from the noumenon of the um, um, mystical conceptualization of self. Because we could say the opposite, that um, there are psychiatric disorders, um, uh, even outside of temporal lobe epilepsy, that by definition might um, help foster, increase, enhance um, spirituality or religiosity in people. But we could also make the opposite claim if you want to use a reductionist perspective, namely that individuals that do not have the same level of spiritual, mystical, transcendent, or religious experience might have different neurological functions. And the, the ultimate judgment, which one is the more proper, which one is the most rational, uh, it's something that we cannot detect specifically um, outside of an interpretation of brain function. So judgment and, and uh, perception, uh, the, the central um, part of uh, our discussion on, on a neurocritical and neurointensive care, and specifically regarding um, temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, and and th this, by the way, this, this conversation is, is, is part of the uh, medical analysis and psychological analysis since you know, the, the, the 1800 and 1900. Um, even, even, even Freud, uh, talking about um, Dostoevsky, uh, claimed that um, epilepsy was indeed involved in change of personality. And that there's plenty of literature in the context of the connection between genius and folly or, or, or mutation changing to um, human personality due to neurological factors. In neuroscience, we mentioned uh, the case of uh, Phineas Gage uh, in Vermont, um, as well as, you know, the more less scientific and more narrative life, uh, narrative like um, literature. Think about uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, for instance. Now, um, there are certain things that we, we need to keep in mind uh, in a more modern sense when we talk about uh, neurosurgery, neurocritical care, which is the connection between computational, automated, um, um, informatics-based, virtual um, uh, based um, interventions and, and what the um, neuromedical engineering can do in terms of supporting patients um, affected by, by these type of problems. And, 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 and I would like to, um, to talk about the application of medical science, um, 
think about um, neurological disorders such as Parkinson disease. Um, and, and, and most of, um, I won't say most, but many of uh, these uh, research studies uh, focus indeed on the regeneration of, uh, of damaged neuronal tissues or, or completely lost uh, neural tissue um, via the engineered version of the mechanical properties of the, of the nervous system. Now, uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that creating artificial electronic circuits uh, mimicking the, the, the neural tissues is an important part of the, this interface, this brain-computer or neural interface um, structure that, that replicate these activities, electromagnetics, electrochemical activity in the body, and uh, account for the possible challenges and rejection of artificial materials by the body. Um, in this context, further research developments uh, cover microelectrodes and optical neural interfaces with fiber optics, as well as complete microsystems to collect and modulate multiple signals and deliver them to the neural tissue. Again, this focuses on neurogenesis, neuroregeneration, neuromodulation, because, because this type of research focuses on, 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 on the transmission delivery modality, so an artificial uh, delivery modality versus a natural delivery modality, so um, amplitude and aperture, length and shape, and population of uh, spikes of action uh, potential um, in the body. So, you know, combining the chemical, electrical, magnetic, and, and optical uh, signals. So, production, transmission, and delivery. Now, uh, because we mentioned neuromodulation, neuroregeneration, um, and neurogenesis, um, the, the main focus here is to correct and rebalance the neural functions of, of a specific brain areas without the, the, the side effects, without negatively affecting uh, neighboring regions or, or causing undesirable side effects. Uh, for instance, uh, problems with, or rather alterations with uh, visual spatial perception, uh, localized or generalized pain. We mentioned that research by Ramachandra in the past, um, as well as, you know, more um, psychiatric related problems such as um, psychomotor agitation, as well as, as tremor. Neurology is connected to uh, neuroscience in general, but also neuropsychiatry and, and neuropsychology uh, because they share uh, clinical interests, uh, agnosia, agraphesthesia, agraphia, alexia, amnesia, anosognosia, aphasia, apraxia, prosodia, ADHD, ASD, but also Alzheimer's, dementia, dyslexia, epilepsy, psychosis, stroke, and traumatic brain injury. Another important uh, subfield within neuroscience, neuroscience and medicine, um, discussed in this chapter, uh, is the field of paleoneurology. Uh, what is paleoneurology? Well, paleoneurology studies the effect of the brain on the skull. Um, or the pressure that exerts on the innermost layer of the skull. Now, th this pressure or imprint is a process called imprintation or endocast. Now, uh, just as we mentioned earlier um, uh, in, in, the, in the context of um, the application of neural mechanisms and brain-computer interface, this uh, virtual uh, modeling readaptation um, through uh, neural engineering, the process of imprintation can also be replicated um, artificially, uh, and this is done to support modeling of the, uh, on the basis of, of uh, applied approaches and, and further developed by the implementation of computed tomography and, and, and uh, computer algorithms, um, as opposed to the natural, to the, the naturally occurring sedimentation through the uh, cranial um, foramina. Now, an important aspect of this is that uh, brains and skulls have been drawn to infer certain characteristics and traits from the very early stages of precursors of modern psychiatry and psychology within paleoneurology, but also in pseudoscientific fields. And we're talking about the history, of course, here of uh, the developments that led to uh, modern paraneurology. And these pseudoscientific fields, of course, um, are fields such as um, phrenology, uh, certain aspects of um, uh, racist uh, pseudoscientific um, uh, claims within eugenics, within the eugenic movement, and to some extent also to um, physiognomy in, in this context. Now, there are several studies that uh, 
um, address the issue with the eugenic movements and and being here in the United States, especially in Vermont, this is something that unfortunately um, invests um, our very history and and. And when we think about uh, the advances in medical sciences, we have to deal with this uh, enormous ethical uh, baggage uh, in the context of decision-making power of the scientific community or the socio-political structure. Um, and um, you know, among the most evident cases of the application of eugenics, uh, we can think of um, science uh, produced and conducted scientific studies in, in England, here in the United States, in Germany, uh, and Sweden, unfortunately, to, uh, up to very recent times. We're talking about the, the 70s here. Um, and, and, and of course, th these studies were arbitrarily decided on, on racial, racist, pseudoscientific claims. Um, so to, to, con to control certain characteristics that were deemed to be uh, unwanted, um, um, unpleasant, uh, unneeded, uh, inhuman offspring. Uh, so th the development of paleontology happened in multiple stages and steps, uh, at times through conflicting uh, and opposed views of researchers. And we mentioned um, physiognomy earlier and phrenology. So just a few names uh, here. Um, Jean Battista de la Porta, Franz Gall, Johann Spurzheim, uh, as well as uh, Thomas Brown, uh, Georges Cuvier, uh, and Etienne uh, Geoffrey Saint Hilaire, um, all the way to uh, Vladimir Blazek, uh, Veronica Kochetkova, um, Emiliano Brunner, um, and Roger Sperry. Of course, in the latter cases, we're talking about um, general polyneurology with Blazek um, and, uh, um, and neuropsychology with Roger Sperry. I just want to clarify this, not to link this back to uh, eugenics in general. But it's important to understand that what we do know nowadays uh, is also the uh, result of historical and sociocultural um, developments. So again, it is impossible to completely separate the scientific enterprise from the, um, the norms, the ethics, the judgment of the um, sociocultural milieu at a time where these uh, scientific studies were indeed performed. Um, now, the connection between uh, different species and races and, and, and the connection with these uh, concepts and ethnocultural subgroups um, are connected to, yet again, uh, discussions on uh, structure and function and purpose within neuroscience, and more specifically within uh, neuroanatomy. Now, to give an example, some researchers believe that certain anatomical features are a sign of cerebral organization moving toward a more uh, human pattern. Um, we're talking about uh, the link between human and non-human animals, and this is the case of Ralph Holloway and the endocast of um, Astropithecus afrensis. While in other um, perspectives, according to other perspectives, think about uh, Dean Falk, uh, these perspectives suggest that these uh, these patterns, uh, more specifically the position of the depression, um, are indicator of the lunate sulcus, similar to what is found in an ape-like sulcal pattern. So difference, similarities. Um, now, scientists uh, are um, in agreement with some basic uh, neurobiological aspects, of course, because that's where the research has led us to this point. Um, but some scientists believe that similarities between skulls from different species could provide proof of relation, which could be justifying similarities in cognitive, emotional functions as well. Um, and uh, and also the, the, as serving as the basis for um, perception, for self-identification, uh, proprioceptic patterns, um, um, conceptualization of self, and identity. Uh, and so this is the um, continuation from last week's discussion uh, in connection to animal modeling within uh, neuroscience. Now, from this perspective, uh, geometry, asymmetry, and or unevenness between the right and left hemisphere could indicate hemispherical specialization, which, as we mentioned two weeks ago, um, could account for specific qualitative and quantitative differences in terms of uh, emotions and behavior, as well as uh, processing uh, speed in, in computational uh, cognitive terms.
Um, let's mention just a few things uh, regarding neurophysiology because this is also a field connected to what we said so far. Uh, but let me just say that uh, clinical neurophysiology is part of medicine as a field uh, here in the United States, but it's an entirely separate field in many uh, European countries. Now, by entirely separate, I mean from an academic educational perspective. Now, of course, everything is, is, is connection here. So to, to uh, identify this connection, well, neurology contributes to a further understanding of disorder from a medical scientific perspective, neurophysiology studies the whole spectrum of uh, neural uh, function, uh, so f including the, the physiology of, of, of neural function. Now, um, what type of research tools uh, do we find here? We have molecular biology-based technology that are con used in combination with uh, imaging techniques, for instance, calcium imaging, um, electrophysiological recording, so patch and voltage clamp, but also field potential and single unit recording technologies um, and um, uh, optogenetics uh, resources. For instance, um, we see EEG utilized to monitor brain waves and compare the structure frequency for the evaluation of possible CNS abnormalities such as seizures. Nerve conduction studies are instead used to investigate a PNS and in combination with EMG to analyze muscles and nerves, while PSG is used for sleep studies. Um, in this context, combination of electroencephalography, electromyography, and evoked potential are found in intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring, IONM, for instance, in somatosensory uh, evoked potential, uh, as, as EPs, transcranial Doppler imaging, or TCDI, transcranial electron more evoked potential, TCEMEP, and many others. Now, neurophysiology is such a vast field that uh, I will not make a list of all the uh, scientists that uh, contributed to it, um, but just a few names in this context. We mentioned Mondino De Liuzzi and Leonardo da Vinci. Um, perhaps um, the work by Niccolo Massa, the, the research at the Venetian College of Physicians on, on the um, cerebrospinal fluid and syphilis is, is um, very, very uh, important, historically speaking, as is the work by Fernelius, um, who was the, the first physician scientist to describe the spinal canal and actually to use the term uh, physiology. Um, other um, famous names that we can mention here is uh, Jason Pertensis, Giulio Cesare Avanzio, uh, Robert Burton, uh, Vincenzo Malacarne, and Johann Webfo. Uh, now, Malacarne, Malacarne is um, relevant to the history of medicine in general because he, he, he um, analyzed uh, the, the cerebellum, which which is uh, is um, is connected to uh, neuroscience in general because uh, Galvani observed the function of nerves and the reaction to electric impulses, um, and then uh, Vic Dazier first and von Semmering after um, described the substantia nigra, and um, uh, Portage studied the subiculum and lateral and medial geniculate bodies. Uh, Ligalois studied, studied the medulla oblongata and the Schwann cells got their name from, of course, the uh, famous uh, Dr. Schwann, uh, another uh, German uh, physiologist. The last topic for this chapter um, is perhaps uh, the best scientific connection between mind and body. Uh, multiple aspects, um, specifically empirical one, laboratory-based, evidence-based, all the way to theoretical, philosophical, and social aspects. I would say that the next um, part of this chapter, the conclusion, the last subfield or uh, connected subfields in a plural is, in this sense, the best explanation. I am talking about psychoneuroimmunology, psychobiology, and psychopharmacology. Now, in the context uh, of psychopharmacology, uh, of course, it is impossible to uh, summarize all the um, psychopharmacological interventions in the context of psychiatry in a 15-week course. So in the textbook, you will find a brief examination in the form of a list of the most important, and by that I mean the most commonly prescribed, uh, modern psychotropic medications. And in this list, you, you find the distinction between antidepressants, antipsychotic, stimulants, uh, and um, sub 
uh, descriptors, labels such as mood stabilizer, anti-anxiety, uh, anti-obsessive, and anti-panic uh, agents. Uh, and um, this list includes both generic, international, as well as uh, US uh, brand uh, names. So this will be uh, for the brief examination of psychopharmacology. Uh, within psychoneurology and psychobiology, uh, I just want to mention a few things. Now, uh, psychobiology is a term that is often used as a synonym for behavioral neuroscience, which we already analyzed um, when we talked about between psyche and mind, also in connection to affective neuroscience. But psychobiology describes the interaction between biological systems and behavior. Now, the focus is on the system-based processes, and I'm talking about the nervous system, um, that determines the me mechanic basis of emotions, thoughts, and actions. Now, a, an elaboration of this point of view and, and, and uh, methodological framework is indeed represented by psychoneuroimmunology. Now, this term was officially used in academia for the first time, uh, at least in the Western uh, world, by the psychologist Robert Aller and the immunologist Nicholas Cohen uh, in the context of their studies on uh, conditioning and uh, immunosuppression. That psychoneuroimmunology further develops the, the analysis on the connection between um, psyche and mind and moves the attention onto the etiological and diagnostic aspects of um, mental, uh, medical uh, disorders and syndromes. Um, and, and in this context, it's really important to understand how mind and body are connected and is um, plenty of scientific evidence demonstrating this, um, thinking about um, somatized features, thinking about um, allergies, uh, hypersensitivities, uh, uh, autoimmune disease, immune deficiencies, and intolerances overall. So uh, the focus here on uh, psychoneuroimmunology is really the biopsychosocial model and uh, preventive medicine, preventing measure uh, to uh, foster uh, effective health strategies and uh, overall uh, well-being. Now, I really encourage students to review some of the bibliographical references provided at the end of this chapter in the textbook. Um, but I would like to mention just a few things here um, because uh, psychoneuroimmunology is so important uh, to understand um, the stress response, uh, the HPA axis, uh, this connection to uh, psychophysical well-being. Um, th think about studies by, by Hans Selye on the general adaptation syndrome or um, studies um, by uh, George Solomon on psychoimmunology. So at this point in our conversation, week eight, passing the midterm, halfway through the semester, uh, if the question is, uh, does mind uh, affect the body? Does mind uh, psychological processes, I dare to say spiritual processes, if by spirit we, we again, we think about terms such as pneuma, vis vitalis, milieu interior, internal states, homeostasis, etc. Do these things, these concepts, these processes influence our physical health? Does our mind influence our psychological state? Does our mind influence our uh, body physiological processes? The answer is a yes full stop. And there is plenty of scientific evidence to support this. What does it mean? Well, there is uh, strong scientific evidence to support things such as meditation and prayer and mindfulness and integrative approaches to medicine. This is no longer up for debate. What it could be up for debate is maybe some misappropriation uh, or misinterpretation of these practices and their uh, specific role in preventive medicine. Another thing I want to mention in this context is there is extremely strong scientific evidence for the importance of emotions, understanding, empathy, I dare to say poetry and creativity for uh, health and well-being. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite um, uh, disappointed to see how uh, there are still some people who have very unscientific claims um, within academia, I would say, or within um, a, how can I define this, within a stereotypical image of academia. Um, and the context is uh, the, the, the presumed clash between uh, liberal arts and STEM fields. Now, I just want to clarify that the distinction between these two exists only in the United States. Um, maybe we could 
pushed it for some parts of the um, Anglo-Saxon academic world, but I feel that it, it's a distinction that really is a description of the, the current situation uh, in the U.S. Now, uh, to, to classify um, liberal arts as opposed to STEM fields is, first of all, um, a demonstration of uh, historical ignorance and also a demonstration of uh, the ignorance of very uh, basic uh, premises and uh, application of the scientific method. Now, uh, uh, liberal arts, uh, arti liberali, since the inception of, since the beginning of um, academia, since the very birth of um, universities um, that in themselves are uh, the connection between the Greek or Roman world and, and medieval uh, Europe, since the beginning, uh, liberal arts included fields such as rhetoric, uh, dialectic, so therefore logic, arithmetic, arithmetic um, geometry, um, and, and, and of course, you know, grammar, astronomy, and music. So um, to consider mathematics, for instance, to consider logic as a non-scientific field, uh, it, it's, it's completely unscientific of a statement. Now, there is this um, um, misappropriation of the term uh, uh, that um, liberal arts are either easier than STEM fields, and if I, if I like to say something in this connection, uh, we could just say that there will be no STEM fields without mathematics or logic to begin with, um, or they are a misrepresentation of what science is and should be. Well, this latter claim I would um, further address in the next week and the following one, so week 9 and 10, simply because we will talk about um, culture and the connection within neuroscience. But um, if there is this um, misinterpretation of liberal arts as either too emotional and less scientific, as if emotions uh, and creativity are separate from science, well, this is both historically false and completely unscientific. Now, since we're talking about scientific evidence, you don't have to take my word for it, aside from the fact that the, the, the history is extremely clear, you just need to study it to see uh, the, the role of emotions and creativity and rhetoric and logic uh, as part of liberal arts for uh, the scientific enterprise. Uh, I just want to mention a few things because from the perspective of neuroscience, uh, there are multiple studies that clearly indicate that uh, the stress response is also mediated by the connection between emotions and empathy. Um, you know, think about the mother-infant connection, the fact that human beings thrive when there is empathy, having the most potential neural growth of any species. Um, and, 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 and this mediation by this connection, it's important because mothers directly impact their baby's cortisol level by their reaction to internal and external stressors and really the hormonal levels. More specifically, this reaction causes different responses in the modulatory ability of their children. Think about the research by Lyons and Ruth. Um, so, uh, psycho in, uh, neuroimmunology, psychobiology, and psychopharmacology are just some of the fields that provide clear scientific evidence for the importance of emotions. I also am very critical of certain claims that emotions, because of this connection with the neuro, uh, neural underpinnings of, of, uh, of thoughts, behavior, and, and, and plasticity, can be reduced to uh, neurochemical or neuroelectromagnetic uh, components as if they are not worth in themselves. This is, this is a very unscientific perspective that, that certain, um, um, certain theoreticians uh, would claim to be uh, the ultimate truth. I also dare to say that some of these theor theoreticians, um, I, th I think of one name that just comes to mind is, is Yuval Harari, it, it, uh, are in themselves not neuroscientists, and so they might misrepresent the, the, the way the scientific field actually is, is developed. Um, but in any case, you don't have to pick and choose between emotion, poetry, and art, and science, logic, and math. We're talking about exactly the same thing, uh, speaking multiple languages in this context. We mentioned this when we talked about embodied cognition and emotional intelligence and so on and so forth. Um, I also want to clarify that because of all these factors, health fully depends um, on, on factors that directly influence biology and is, uh, from, uh, from a broad perspective, influenced by biology. So there is a connection, there is connectedness, there's connectivity with others. Another uh, research um, that I often quote is the one by Candace Pert that um, 
was uh, able to, to demonstrate that, that neuropeptides and, and neurotransmitters directly impact the, the, the immune system. And that this system and the endocrine system are modulated by the entire central nervous system. So not, not on the brain, but the whole CNS. And they are deeper connected to the processes involved, again, in emotions, cognitions, self-awareness, etc. Another research on um, neuroimmune interaction is the one by David Felton. And uh, certain perspectives are more current uh, on the enteric nervous system, the intrinsic nervous system, have to do with the so-called second brain and the function of gastroenteric neurotransmitters. Think about studies conducted by um, McConaughey, by, by um, Lucina Krause, by Lichkova, by Porro and, and Gershon. Now, um, there are other things to, uh, to keep in mind here. Um, connecting multiple systems and, and working on perspectives of immune alterations producing uh, changes in behavior and, and, and vice versa, behaviorally induced changes to the immune system, uh, directly help uh, these disciplines to study the best medication strategies for the treatment of mental health disorders. Um, so think about um, a, a deeper understanding of, of protein binding, uh, half-life, polymorphic genes, and drug-to-drug -drug interactions. This, again, goes back to um, the complexity of um, behavioral aspects and uh, the fact that, according to uh, the Wikian expression, um, coscienza non è conoscenza. Again, in this last uh, part of this lecture, I want to mention one more thing. So, uh, we talked about the problems where we are forcing an em too empiricist, too materialist, uh, too uh, mechanistic explanation for uh, neurological processes and psychological processes. And this is, again, uh, the issue that we just mentioned about psychiatry becoming increasingly um, neurologized in this sense. So we talk about the benefits and the, uh, and, and the mistakes of this uh, more extreme view. Um, but one of the, the quotes that I always like to mention to clarify this aspect is a quote by Giambattista Vico, the Italian philosopher, a very famous Italian philosopher. Uh, and the quote says, um, Coscienza non è conoscenza. So um, consciousness, conscience, I would say even, it's not knowledge per se. Now, we have, of course, to separate conscience from consciousness, but the idea of a quantitative um, hierarchy that is responsible for a wakeful state, for instance, it's not in itself representative of knowledge. And this, again, goes back to this tripartite um, phenomenon that, that we, we, we discussed when we mentioned Aristotle, so techne, um, and episteme. Uh, and it also has to do with uh, perception. But uh, to give a, yet another example of the connection between neuroscience um, and medicine, specifically psychiatry, uh, I just want to mention one of the most recent research studies uh, that my team and I have published and it's a research on olfactory virtual reality, uh, a research that um, indicated, the results indicated, uh, that there were benefits in, uh, in the areas of stress, of pain perception, of uh, mood changes, uh, through the utilization of this device that uh, stimulated the olfactory bulb as well as the um, occipital uh, lobe, the, uh, the uh, um, visual cortex, to uh, promote an overall sense of relaxation and well-being. Uh, there is a specific playlist that discusses this research, uh, but I would just like to mention just a few things um, in this lecture. And if you are interested in this type of research, please feel free to click on the provided link and find out more about olfactory virtual reality uh, on the basis of this very recent research study that we, we published. So we could say many other things about uh, the topic, but I think this is a good place to conclude today's lecture, uh, also to give you the chance to uh, digest some of the things that we covered so far. Again, a slightly tangential direction um, in comparison to only talking about psychology. Uh, this week, we really expand upon healthcare in general, 
Because again, the ultimate goal should also be part of what we're doing here. We don't study something just to uh, gain credits, or I hope that is the case. And even if we started off by taking a course to simply satisfy the requirements of a degree, I really hope that you will use some of the things we discussed so far to ameliorate your own life, to improve the connection you have with yourself and others. And this possibly could also be part of your future, whether you want to embark on a clinical path or simply you are interested in discovering more about yourself and what makes us human beings. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, we passed the midterm. Um, so we are uh, going to see each other um, in week nine. Congratulations to all of you. Feel free to reach uh, out to me if you have any questions. Uh, I will see you all next week.